dodge this. One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole? Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning around. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. It is November 17th, 2015. Just a couple short days, about what, nine days before Thanksgiving 2015? Something that maybe we can all sit down and talk about tonight a little more serious than holiday fun. Maybe, maybe during the the next nine days leading up to Thanksgiving, maybe even on Thanksgiving itself, you could sit down with your family and you can have a conversation about this broadcast tonight, about what's going on. Maybe you can educate your family and your friends and maybe, just maybe, more can be done about this. Maybe we can help the people that I'm going to be talking about tonight. What could I be talking about that I find extremely important that I think that you should be talking about it for the next nine days at least nine months nine years how about that that would be the Westlake nuclear waste landfill and all the ongoing issues now if you remember about two weeks ago I did a broadcast where I covered this and I had an activist on her name's Dawn Chapman and I was only able to get her on for the last like 15-20 minutes of the broadcast and it was a very powerful very powerful short time and I wanted to get her back on I had the chance to sit and talk to her off air for a while after the show amazing lady absolutely an amazing lady very strong a lot of strength and a lot of courage in her heart and in her friend Karen's heart as well the other lady that's helped them that's helped her and that works with her on uh, the group I think it's if I remember correctly it's just moms STL but I'll I'll have her plug everything in any Twitter and Facebook and websites and all that before we even get into it so I don't want to waste any more time I'm going to give her most of the the airtime on the show I mean I'll ask her questions and stuff but I want to give her as much time to talk to you all ladies and gentlemen and explain in as much detail as she feels is necessary the entire picture, the entire big picture of what's going on over at Westlake and what it means for people's health, what it means for what they're dealing with right now, the intimidation she's been receiving because of opening her mouth and having the courage to stand up. That's why I said she's got a lot of strength and a lot of courage in her heart. 
So let's welcome back to the broadcast for a full two hours tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Dawn Chapman. Dawn, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me again. So let's start at the beginning. Let's, let's pick it up like we were talking about off air. Let's, let's pick it up in the beginning. And, and the beginning is where you feel people need to learn about Westlake because you're directly affected by it. So take as much time as you want. Explain to the listeners, the new listeners, let's say the new people that have never heard of Westlake. You can pick it up there, I guess. Why this is so important. You know, I, I want people to understand, first of all, that um, we call ourselves Just Moms STL. We really are just moms. Um, Karen and myself are two moms who um, we stay at home with our kids. We thought we had just the perfect life. We live in these tiny, tiny, itty-bitty little three-bedroom, one-bathroom house, you know, these houses. And we really are very content. Um, Our lives were changed almost overnight when we found out about, um, first of all, the role that our city, St. Louis, played in the Manhattan Project. We had no idea that when it comes to the Manhattan Project and the nuclear weapons, that St. Louis opened the first chapter that we actually processed the very first uranium that went into the first self-sustaining nuclear fission um, reaction that occurred under the stadium in Chicago. And the reason that's important is because where we live, it's very much still one of the best-kept secrets in St. Louis. And so two moms who live right around the corner from each other but absolutely didn't know each other before this situation, we met because we both found out that we lived next to a Superfund site, which is a landfill that um, was on fire. It has a, an underground smoldering landfill fire burning. It's been burning now for almost six years. And that across the landfill from it, completely connected but adjacent to it, sits um, the world's oldest nuclear weapons waste from the processing of uranium in St. Louis that was illegally dumped there, some um, 49,000 tons um, about the weight of the Gateway Arch. And so for both of us, we had lived in this area for a very long time. We had chosen this area to raise our kids in. We liked the school district. This was not something that we knew about. So she... Karen found out before I did and created a Facebook page, West Lake Landfill. But her story goes even deeper. Our, the role that St. Louis played in the Manhattan Project was top secret. It was classified. Even the workers, um, they weren't allowed to tell their families. Many of them didn't know that they were working on this secret project. And those that did weren't allowed to ever speak about it. So because of that secrecy and because of the rush to, um, to process uranium in St. Louis and in order to beat Germany, um, this waste was horribly mismanaged. You know, there were a lot of spills. And because, again, it was top secret, they didn't want to draw people's attention to these spills. So they just pretended like, you know, some of these dump trucks were just carrying dirt, and they would spray it off the side of roads into ditches, and um, in the, during the processing of this waste downtown in St. Louis, um, there was so much of this waste left over that they decided to go and store it out in the open next to a ball field at our airport site, and so this waste sat out in, um, in mountains, if you will, in two-story piles. And it wasn't fenced in. It sat next to a creek, and every time it would rain or the wind would blow, it would leak into that creek. Karen lived and grew up right downwind of this. And the park that she played in as a child every day, they're now digging this radioactive waste out of it. And so 
fast forward from all of that three years ago, Karen and I both found out that that nuclear weapons waste that sat out next to the airport that spilled, that blew all over, that leaked into the creek, had been illegally dumped and had been sitting on the surface of a landfill in our neighborhood where we chose to raise our children, and it had been there for over 40 years. And nobody told us about this. We had no idea. So after we found out about it, you can imagine that we were very shocked. But also, as just being parents, just being moms, and knowing absolutely nothing about science of this material, I think in the back of everybody's mind, um, there was this feeling of, okay, this can't be good. This has to have a consequence. You cannot leave radioactive nuclear weapons waste from the Manhattan Project just sitting out in communities, not covered on the surface for that long, and for it not to have blown in the wind, you know, there, 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 we knew instantly that there was some sort of consequence to that. And, you know, with the fire burning and the fact that so few of our neighbors knew about this, we all, we all would talk about this horrible smell. We would all go out. It was almost a cross between a dead body, a house on fire, garbage. It was the most unique, unbelievable smell. And I, even to this day, I have a very difficult time describing it to people other than to say that it is so strong and so potent that it actually sticks to your clothing. So if you're outside and you encounter it and you go in, you can actually still smell it on your clothes. But we all were talking about that and, and what could that be? Why is it smelling like this in our neighborhood? Little by little, as the story began to unfold, our little area, our little community, began to wake up. So that is how, three years ago, this situation became known to myself, Kieran, and many of the other residents living in this area. So even though many of the listeners are just finding out about this through national press and CBS, I want you guys to understand that we have been fighting this, you know, 40-plus hours a week now for going on three years. We have been doing everything we can think of to reach out to our fire department, our elected officials, our superintendents of our school districts, our PTO, our local hospital, our businesses. We've done everything we can as two moms to try and get this out. You know, it was never our intention to be alarmists, although, quite frankly, a fire next to radioactive waste, I think, in and of itself is very alarming, and it should be. You know, we never entered this thinking that three years down the line we would be where we are today and that we would be fighting so hard against a broken bureaucracy and fighting this Two, two multi-billion dollar corporations, Republic Services and Exelon, who is just a leader and a behemoth in the nuclear industry, and along with our federal government. You know, this was not something that we thought, you know, this is not what we wanted to be when we grew up. So I really want people to understand we really are just moms who found out about this three years ago and have been boots on the ground fighting literally for our lives and for the lives of our children for the past three years. Don't I hope that that, that the, yes. No, I was going to say, can you go ahead and plug all your stuff before we forget? Like plug your Twitter, Facebook pages, groups, anything, websites. Go ahead. Absolutely. We have a Facebook page. We have two now. One is West Lake Landfill. Just three words. West Lake Landfill. The other is just Moms STL. We are asking people to get on social media um, and to come and join our page and to help us. We, our Twitter is just Moms STL. You can follow us on Twitter. Our website is stlradwastelegacy.com. That is also a great way for you to get involved and find up-to-date information. You know, this is one of the, that's one of the only ways we have right now social media to connect 
with our, not only our own community, but outside communities. Agreed. People should use social media to organize. And um, I might open up the phone lines uh, later on. Anybody calling in right now, there's, there's a toll-free number. Uh, I would like, if I open them up, I'm going to open them up to the residents of the Westlake area because I would you know, perhaps like to get a few more of you on and let you speak your minds a little bit. But I, that's, ta- that's if time permits. I want to make sure I give Dawn enough time to speak and we, I want to cover the issues um, in as much detail as we can so people get a better understanding of why this is so important. But I, I just wanted to throw that out there because I know uh, when I had promoted it on Facebook earlier that I had thrown the uh, 800 number, the call-in number out there. So, and I know there's a couple people prob- uh, hanging on the, uh, the call-in line number. So if you guys want to hang out, you can hang out and listen to the, the show that way. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm going to leave the lines. Like, I'm not going to go to them and bring anybody up because I want to give Dawn as much time. So anyway, Dawn, you've been doing this for three years now. First question I have is, why has it taken three years for you guys to get any sort of attention? And I mean, even like in the alternative media. Right. I, I honestly don't have an answer to that. To us in the very beginning, the very, it, it's not because this isn't a serious issue. It was very clear with my first phone call to the state of Missouri about this, that this issue had everybody behind the scenes. So the state of Missouri and the federal government were absolutely, um, they were terrified of this issue. They knew that the moment that they had an underground fire the size of six football fields (laughs) burning next to radioactive waste, that they had the potential for a catastrophic situation at this landfill. That was made very clear three years ago from the very beginning, and what I couldn't understand then and what I still don't understand now is if the state and the federal government were that worried about it, why was it that two moms had to take it upon themselves to educate the elected officials in the state of Missouri as well as the senators on what was happening in the Manhattan Project? As, as freaked out and as worried as those two agencies were, the state of Missouri and the Environmental Protection Agency, the federal government, Neither one of them did their due diligence to reach out to not just the community, but the elected officials. I cannot even tell you how many times I would call an elected official and they just, they were floored. Some of them didn't even know the role that St. Louis played in the Manhattan Project. It's like it's still top secret here. And it takes... I can't tell you the hours that it takes on the phone with these people to, to show them these documents. You know, we've tried to be very respectful and walk them through and say, let me show you. Look at where this fire is. Look at this radioactive waste. Look at the readings. Look at the counts per minute. Look at what they're finding in the groundwater at the site. Look at the places it's on the surface. It has taken us the better part of three years just to get these people to wrap their head around how serious the situation is in the Manhattan Project. And now that we've gotten them to the point where they have, unfortunately, you still have a fire that is creeping towards this radioactive waste or, for that matter, another fire that could start in the vicinity. These landfill fires do start up on their own. We had one last year that tried to stop separate from the one that's currently burning even closer to the radioactive waste. I mean, this is, it's an absolute nightmare, not just for this community and not just for the residents, but to some extent for um, the elected officials. We do have quite a few now who are paying attention and perking up, but the problem is they all, what do we do with this situation? How do we, how do we stop a fire from hitting nuclear weapons waste? You know, these fires are really complex on their own. Even if there wasn't nuclear weapons waste at this landfill, there are a lot of emissions and toxic chemicals coming off of this burning Superfund site. But then you add in the potential that exists for this fire to hit this radioactive waste, and you really have a perfect storm occurring at this landfill that's never happened anywhere else. So, you know, 
I guess what we have a hard time with in media is how to fit everything that I just said into a minute and a half clip. You yeah, know, and, the, and the, to play it on the news. Yeah, because the mainstream only gives you a minute and a half. Well, that's why I'm giving you two hours. And look, I'm going to just throw this out there right now. I know there's a lot of alternative media bloggers and hosts of other radio shows and podcasts that tune into my broadcast. I'm going to urge you all to reach out to Dawn, and I'm going to have her throw out her contact info and stuff. And I, I urge you to reach out to her and Karen and try to help them. Get them on your shows. Interview them. Give them more than a minute and 30 seconds to say their piece. That's why I'm giving you two hours tonight. So with that in mind, throw out a contact email or the best way to get in touch with you, Donna. Please email us at westlakemoms at gmail.com. Again, westlakemoms at gmail.com. And neither Karen or myself will respond. And going back to your comment about the government not doing its due diligence or doing anything to really help you guys, I saw that, that, uh, that I guess it was like a town hall type meeting you guys had. I think it was towards the end. It wasn't the presentation you gave. It was like the week after where the, the EPA guy came in and bored everybody to tears for the first like hour and a half and made everybody like fall asleep. And then they got into the meat and potatoes, which is par for the course with these people. That's actually a, a tactic that they use. But I saw that in the EPA, their answer to everybody that was there, and everybody was upset, you know, worried about what was going on. And they, they, kind, of, they kind of just tried to pat everybody on the head and tell them it was going to be okay and they'd take care of it. And then they said, we'll get back to you by end of calendar year about what we're going to do about the fire. And I was like, right. wait, what? end of calendar year that thing's less than a thousand feet from the nuke waste like don't you think you should be more concerned about it than then we'll get back to you at the end of calendar year it just makes you wonder it really does it, it, is, it really has and it's been like that with that agency from the beginning in all honesty i was i i admit i was very naive i thought that well karen and i both thought that all we needed to do, EPA had made some mistakes. We established that very quickly, that they did not have a good historical understanding of what this waste was, where this radioactive waste came from, and what they found from the site that this site, that, that Westlake came from. And we thought, okay, this is bad. This is a mistake. This has consequences. However, all we have to do is go to them. We have to present them with our facts, and um, they'll take it from there. And three years later, we're still waiting for that to happen. You know, um, I really and honestly think that every time I see EPA, and they've changed, everybody at EPA Region 7 has changed now. Like, they, instead of dealing with the problem, they just move people around. You know, they, they find somebody else to sit in the spot. And it's very, it's very heartbreaking, but it's very true that... It, I, we can look at these people now when they're up there and speaking, and we can actually watch their facial features start to change. They go from, okay, this isn't a problem, no big deal, we'll get back to you. Some of the ones that have been there long enough, and when they really start looking at these documents we're giving them, you can actually watch them kind of go, oh, no, oh, no. And it's right at the point where they start to get concerned and they start to speak up within the agency that they mysteriously end up getting moved to other positions. And that's very frustrating because then somebody else takes their place and we have to start all over from scratch. And, um, you know, I, I think that at the end of the day, this is such a complex situation that it's never happened before. But at the same time, EPA has had this site for almost 20 years and this radioactive waste is still sitting on the surface. Everybody listening, just remember, you know, we, we put a man on the moon in a shorter time. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do within a five-year span, and yet this radioactive waste has sat there for 20 years, and they're still trying to figure out where it is, how much of it they have, and what the particle size is. I mean, the investigation into what is Westlake Landfill, what is this radioactive waste, how much is it? How hot is it? What's the chemical signature? 
that's something that EPA admittedly is still trying to figure out. And I think if you watch that meeting and if you can go to the you know website and watch it on YouTube, we videoed it, what you will notice is you see an agency telling you everything's okay in one breath, but then turning around in the other and saying, but we're investigating, we're further characterizing, and we're checking the groundwater, and we're trying to figure out why. And it doesn't take but a mom or a dad, an ordinary person, not a scientist, to stand up and say, excuse me. So if you're telling me you don't know what it is, where it is, how much you have, but yet in the next sentence you're telling me safe, isn't that, you know, it's safe and no problem, isn't that a contradiction? And it just shut the entire meeting down. Yeah, because they you can't know, or answer that. They, they can't answer it. They have no real answers. And um, that, I think, is the most frustrating thing for this community. The other thing I want people to understand, and I want to talk a little bit about Karen and, and, and myself, and this is where I apologize if I get a little emotional. Dawn, um, can I, can I, can I cut you <laughs> off? Because just as you're yeah. getting to that, the break is going to sneak up, and I don't want you to get cut off. Okay. Of it. So I'm going to have you hold that thought for just three short minutes, and then I promise oh. we'll pick it right up there. So stay, stay right there. Ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. I urge you to check out what's going on. Go to the Facebook pages, groups, support them, spread the word, help these ladies, and help the people near the Westlake landfill. That's what this is about. We'll be right back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, so I want to get right back into it. Dawn, while we were about to go to break, and you were just about to get into something about you and Karen, and I know it's got to be deep, because you had said, uh, forgive you if you get emotional. So, And by the way, I, I wholeheartedly believe that the listeners would totally uh, understand any emotion that you share. So that's what's really cool about my listeners. They're awesome people, and uh, they're, they're down like that. So it's all good. Anyway, since the break interrupted us there, I want to go back to you and give you the floor. Picking up right where you left off, you were talking about you and Karen. So what I want the listeners to understand, um, and this is kind of the emotional side of this story, I want you to know that, um, first of all, nobody wants this site to be not as bad as it is than Karen or myself, and I hope that makes sense. You know, we live next to it. We're raising our families next to it. There is nothing more that we would like to hear, then, guys, the site is safe, it's fine, go back to life as it was. So keep in mind that, you know, when we're finding these things and these faults with EPA and some of the stuff that they're saying, we are not nitpicking, we are not looking for a reason for this site to be, you know, to, to, to disagree with some of their findings about no immediate health risk and whatnot. Because what you don't hear is when an EPA says there's no immediate health risk, what you don't hear is Karen and I call them up on the phone and say, okay, well, talk to me about long-term health risk. I'm not worried about what's going to happen when I wake up tomorrow and I take my kid and we wait out at the, at the bus stop. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about 10 years from now what's going to happen to my little girl from breathing in these emissions and living next to this radioactive waste that's just been allowed to sit on the surface. And the response that we get, it's the same response we got three years ago, is, well, unfortunately, there are no studies that really show chronic long-term exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation. I mean, we get, we get the same canned response that we know, and that's hard as a parent. But what I want... The other thing I want the listeners to understand, I want you guys to know that, first of all, I am not sick yet, but Karen is. And a lot of the people that volunteer, a lot of the moms, there's so many more moms and dads and uncles and aunts and uncles that are part of this. And because of the history of the Manhattan Project in our city, because it was allowed to sit out and leak into our creeks and our playgrounds, and when we were out picking up Easter egg hunts at church picnics, we were right downwind of sites that had two-story piles of this. Because of that, there are 
so many sick people and people that have lost loved ones. It is an absolute legacy of heartache that it has left in our city. And I think the worst part is that so many people don't know about it. And through the outreach that Karen and I have had to do and the other moms reaching out to neighbors and friends that we went to school with and relatives that lived in different areas, there is a, the outreach to this is very difficult. There is a, if I could use the word, a feeling that Karen and I are kind of like the Grim Reapers of St. Louis. You know, when we reach out to a woman whose who's park is currently being tested for radioactive waste and they're finding it, when you knock on a person's door or they're out front and you walk up to them to talk about this, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. You don't know whose loved ones they, you know, how many loved ones they've lost. Maybe they've had to bury a child. And there, I cannot describe it accurately to tell you that, but that there is this look that 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 go comes over a person when you say, well, you know, do you know what they're digging right over there? Do you know what they're finding? And they're like, oh, well, no, it's construction work. And we say, no, that's radioactive waste. Well, how, you know, when we go through the story, you can tell by a person's facial features if they've had some sort of um, traumatic loss in their life. And when you explain to a person who, for whatever reason, has had to bury a child to a rare brain tumor, when you explain to that person that they were allowed to grow up in a neighborhood and live during a period of time when this waste was constantly being dumped at this landfill, it is like you were peeling off a scab. You are exposing a raw wound that may never heal. You, Whatever it is, that that person has come to terms with in their life that has allowed them to be able to get up every single morning and um, face this world and accept their loss and come to terms with the reason that that loss happened, that is completely stripped of that person. Whatever little bit of peace that that person has held on to that keeps them going, that is absolutely torn away. When you tell somebody that their federal government let nuclear weapons waste, sit out knowingly, leaking into, you know, leaking into parks and creeks and blowing. And there, what that does to Karen and I, I can't even really tell you on this phone. It is so heartbreaking. We cry for those people. We hug. There are people that are very angry because we have alerted them to this fact. And it's not personal. I understand it, you know, that they are dealing with it in their own way. But I, I, I need the listeners to understand that St. Louis, there are so many people hurting. And every day when Karen and I get up, you know, people say, we tell them this, this is like a 40-hour-a-week job for us. We're trying to get our kids off to school. We go down and get on Facebook and I'm telling you, I have at least one, I can count on one, sometimes more than one message of somebody who is sick, who's reaching out to me. I'm sick. I'm scared. I just found a lump. Here's where I grew up. I'm finding out about this now. Can you please call me? And of course we call them. Why wouldn't we? Of course we call. And we cry and we pray with them. And, you know, we get off the phone and that's two hours that we've lost. And so this 40-hour-a-week-plus job, it's more than just letting, you know, fighting these agencies in this company and trying to get some sort of solution to where a fire doesn't hit radioactive waste. We're actually in the role of counselor. And, you know, it, it, it starts to take a toll after a long time. It really does. And not only that, we still find people within our own families friends who, um, you know, reach out to us and say, hey, my uncle, my uncle just got diagnosed with this very rare cancer. And, you know, how do you break it to them that what they're being told is a rare cancer isn't rare in St. Louis because of the fact that this waste was allowed to sit out? I mean, it is a nonstop barrage for us. And 
one of the things that we could use help with is we need people to not just join social media, but to get involved so that we have people that we can um, have these people contact so that it's not just Karen and I having these conversations. We need other people to be having these conversations with these people too, you know, and it's, it's, it's a double whammy for us. It's always very eye-opening when we're speaking with an elected official who suddenly makes that connection and is like, oh, my goodness, I lost a niece and a nephew. And you know what I'm saying? And, and, it, and it clicks for them. And then suddenly, you know, there, there's this moment where they understand that this isn't just their constituents that this is affecting. This has actually been allowed to affect them on a very personal level. And I think what we're seeing, because I know there are other sites across this nation where this radioactive waste sits out and it harms communities. This is not a new story. But the secrecy of it here in St. Louis is what is so heartbreaking and what we're up against and we're, we're fighting. And, you know, even as we're speaking right now on the phone, I literally got an email from one of the congressmen of St. Louis, his aide, and I, I just, one of the things he said here, if I could read this really quickly to the listeners, he says, how the cleanup goes forward at Westlake Landfill will depend solely on science. And in this case, like Westlake, we have a responsibility to follow the facts and tell the truth instead of making up fiction and exploiting the fears of long suffering families. That is an email I just received from a congressman. So evidently, that is his impression and opinion on what it is this community is doing, that we are exploiting the fears and the heartbreak of people that have lost people from this radioactive waste. So when, when the listeners want to know why is it that there is nothing happening Nothing happening on the federal government end. Why is it nobody is moving on this issue? Remember that that is the opinion of a federal congressman on what's happening in his own district in St. Louis. What's his name again, Don? I just got this from Congressman Clay, from his aide. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, I'm heartbroken by that because I really challenge this person to come and, and spend a day with Karen and I. I'll make you a whole pot of coffee and you can sit here and you can read. You, you can come down with us, watch us get on Facebook. You can read these people. You can see that these cancers aren't rare. We can show you whole streets that are next to a contaminated creek where people in every single house have lost countless loved ones to rare, what, what are rare cancers, but yet are an entire street, and the only thing they have in common is their kids were allowed to play in a creek that was contaminated with radioactive waste. Give his full I mean, name out this, really quick. Give his, give his full name this, out. I just received an email from Congressman Lacey Clay's aide, and I got to tell you, that is a very unfair statement for anybody to make. Okay, so that this is, is a very unfair thing for a congressman to say to two moms who have gone through our own losses, one of whom is sick because she played in a creek that was contaminated with this waste. And I think that's almost a bully statement, in my opinion. I'm, I'm, I'm very angry, and I apologize. I, 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 I just read that, and I thought, you, you have got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. His constituents are hurting. There are people right now, I could go up to people who have this creek in their backyard and know nothing about this. I could take you right now, Popeye. We could go this weekend if it's not raining. I could take you to that creek that they're still doing additional testing and that they're still testing in the floodplain and finding radioactive waste. I could take you to that creek and show you that there are no signs on it and that kids are still in there playing and hunting crawdads. There is something horribly wrong going on right now in St. Louis, 
And it is not just about a landfill that has a fire with radioactive waste sitting on the surface next to it. It is so much bigger than, than that situation. That situation alone has the ability to endanger countless people in this area through what would happen if that fire would hit the radioactive waste. But I want the listeners to understand that there are places right now in my community where we know this waste is sitting out. And we know that kids are potentially exposed to it, and yet there are no signs. Nobody will talk about this. And instead of our elected officials doing the right thing and getting signs up along this creek, instead of that happening, we're being accused of exploiting their losses and their heartbreaks. which is obviously garbage. I mean, you guys are people that are experiencing the, the heartbreaks. I'm actually trying to find his um, Twitter account so people can Twitter, send Twitter messages to him. Um, I did find his information. Don, which, which office does he spend more time at, Washington or the, his St. Louis office? I don't know. I don't know, but it's completely unfair, and I would just contact both if I were a listener. I... Um, I, to be fair, this guy is calling for the removal of the radioactive waste, and he is the first of our four federally elected officials to call for the removal. But for him to say something like that, I, 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 you can't in one breath say this waste has to go and then say, well, but people are exploiting and this is about science. Listen, nobody needs to be a scientist to know that children don't belong to p- playing in creeks with radioactive waste in it. There is a level of logic that you have to apply to these situations. And we don't need to be arguing over, well, acute versus chronic exposure, long-term exposure. We know for a fact that children should not be exposed to Manhattan Project waste from the bomb anywhere. And regardless of if an elected official wants to argue that or not, I would state that the very least that needs to happen is there ought to be signs up and parents and families ought to be told about this situation and then let them decide. Let them decide if they want their kids playing in a creek or a park that has flooded constantly and is probably about to flood now with all the rain we're getting here in St. Louis. I, this kind of mentality needs to stop. And that is one thing that Karen and I are very adamant about. We are not running for office. We are not politicians. We are just moms. And I'm not worried about offending an elected official because, frankly, I'm more worried about my children dying of cancer. That's my top priority. Well, And I'm more worried about my neighbor's kids. Lacey Clay can be found. I went right to the um, house.gov website. Right on his page, contact page, it says right here, If you are writing to Congressman Clay for assistance on a personal matter, please do not use the the little contact form email system they have here. Instead, you'll be able to obtain assistance more quickly by contacting his downtown office at Everybody Get Your Pens and Pencils Out. His downtown office phone number is, and this is all public information, 314-367-1970. Or his South City office at 314-669-9393. And I'll give you the Capitol Hill number, but it's probably good luck with that. The Capitol Hill phone number is 202-225-2406. And the fax number is 202-226-3717. And you can go back and listen to the archives and pull the numbers out again, or just look up Lacey Clay. Just go onto Google and type in Lacey Clay contact info, and poof, the page will come right up, and you'll be able to actually see what I just read to you. I urge all of you to call. Now, the one thing I'm going to tell you is if you do call, be polite, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to call yelling and screaming. That's not going to get your point across, and that doesn't help represent Dawn, Karen, or anybody in a positive light. So keep your cool. I know sometimes that's hard. Trust me, I get it. But be polite. But let them know 
that you don't think what they said to Dawn was appropriate because I don't think it was appropriate, especially considering she lives there. She's affected by it. Karen's extremely affected by it. That's insulting, to say the least. It's like spitting in their face. And these are his constituents. These are the people he is supposed to represent. So why don't we help them out a little bit? This is what, this is what real activism is about. And if I can find his Twitter account, then people can politely tweet him. But you know what? You, the listener, can do that. You're all pretty smart. You're all extremely intelligent. So go out there. Go, go find his contact info. Be polite, but tell them. You don't like what they said. You think it's like spitting in someone's face. It's spitting in a victim's face. And it's not about science. It's about lobbyists and how much money they can throw at congressmen or presidents. The nuke industry has a ton of money. Just, just remember that. Anyway, so this is a very you know, personal thing for you, Dawn. It's very personal, and I would urge the, is, the listeners to also call the other four federally elected officials, Senator Claire McCaskill, Senator Roy Blunt, and Congresswoman Ann Wagner, and um, you know, make your voices heard. What I'd really like, and, and I want people to remember this, you know, obviously these elected officials don't think that this is real and that you all have lost loved ones. And even those of you from a different state or who have lost loved ones to other environmental issues or issues of mismanagement by the federal government, feel free to call our elected officials up in the state of Missouri and let them know that that has happened to you. And for those listening in Missouri, tell them your personal stories. This is not about the science. Explain to them. If you were one of those kids that played in the creek, call them up and tell them so. You know, they need to hear your personal stories, and they need to understand that the mismanagement of the Manhattan Project Waste in St. Louis has left this legacy of heartbreak across this region, and that people are waking up to it, and that we're not going to stand for it anymore. That this is not something that should ever have been allowed to happen, but the fact that it's still sitting there and it's still being allowed to happen, you know, we, we need to stand up and be the generation that, that, that puts this waste away and gets this cleaned up for good. I, I mean, this is, just, this is just a, a, a horrendous situation that's happened. And what I, what I want you guys to do, Dawn, you guys are on Twitter again, right? You guys have Twitter accounts? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have you give out the give out the Twitter account names really quick. Um, just Moms STL is is our main Twitter handle. You can um, find me at Dawn Chapman STL on Twitter and um, Westlake Landfill on Twitter. And we also have a Westlake Moms on Twitter handle as well. And you know we would appreciate all the follows you guys can give, and and we need your help. I think you guys are now seeing what we're up against. As a community, I want to create a Twitter bomb, and everybody can go find them on Twitter and then follow them. Put them in the you know the tweet, and put you know tweet it at these the these congressmen and women, these senators. I'm going to have you give out that list again with the names again one more time, Don. But I want people to go tweet hashtag go to Westlake, hashtag yes. go to Westlake, and tw- you know what? Tweet it to any all these politicians, all of them up in Congress and in Senate. All of them, all the state politicians, all of them, every one of them, Twitter bomb, hashtag go to Westlake. And I urge you to include in there the, the Twitter accounts, the Twitter handles, at least one of them that Dawn just threw out. And I'll have her, I'm going to have you shamelessly plug those one more time and then give out the, the list of politicians uh, directly there. And then I, I, I that you were, you just mentioned, and I urge the listeners after Dawn says that, to not only do that, but like I said, reach out to all these congressmen and women and these senators and reach out to the state politicians as well. Tweet them. Find them on Twitter. They like to make themselves accessible on social media. Well, let's use it to our advantage. So hashtag go to Westlake. Go ahead, Dawn. The floor is yours. Please uh, follow us on Dawn Chapman STL, Twitter, um, Just Moms STL, Westlake Moms, and... Um, for our elected officials, we have Congressman um, William Lacey Clay, Congresswoman Ann Wagner, Senator Claire McCaskill, and Senator Roy Blunt. 
And those are the four that we really need you guys to contact and reach out to. Yeah, and I urge you seriously, ladies and gentlemen, please send emails. Um, again, no ranting, no yelling, no screaming. If you really want to help Dawn and Karen and the rest of the people that are affected by the ongoing problems over at Westlake, then I ask you to please use a little restraint, be calm, and be professional when talking to these people. Because remember, if you email them and you start yelling and screaming or you, you do that on the phone, they're not going to pay any attention to you. The reason for the Twitter bomb is because then it creates attention and you know, hopefully we can get a couple, at least a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand retweets over the course of a couple days of people doing that. And it is effective because it, it forces some light on them and the subject at the same time. And if they keep getting phone calls, they can't run from it forever. Remember that. And you have to hold these people's feet to the fire. You know, a lot of these people you elected, ladies and gentlemen, don't let them just get off with not taking care of business and talking to people or sending Dawn a very flippant, rude email like that. I mean, that's out of line. It's extremely it's, it's out of line. It's more than out of line. It's, it's more than out of line. And, you know, I would say this w- one more thing for people to understand because it's so hard to wrap your head around what's happening here and the emotional heartbreak of this. I, we have people that fall on two sides with this issue, at least with the Manhattan Project and the bomb. Some that think that that was wrong, we should never have done that. Some that think it was patriotic. I'm not even going to weigh in on that issue, but what I am going to say is this, that these bombs and this radioactive waste that's been allowed to sit out in our communities was created as part of the war effort during World War II. It was top secret, it was classified, and it was done by the federal government. And these people that are playing in crease, these people that have lost loved ones from this material, in a sense, they are... They are victims of World War II. They, they are veterans, and not only that, but these people that are exposed to this waste and that are harmed by it in St. Louis, these people are becoming ill, and they're dying from friendly fire. You know, this is friendly fire that is hurting these people in St. Louis, and that is a very jagged pill for these people to swallow. Um. Heartbreaking. I, I have no doubt that it's heartbreaking and like a sucker punch to the stomach with epic proportions. I'm gonna pause this right there, Don, because the end of the first hour is coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, three short minutes. We will be right back. Do not go anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host Popeye from FederalJack.com, PopeyeRadio.com, and of course my rather large YouTube radio archive, DTRH radio archives over on YouTube, Delta Tango Romeo Hotel. Radio archives. Delta Tango Romeo Hotel radio archives over on YouTube. Go check it out. Anyway, hour number two, we're discussing Westlake and all the issues surrounding it. And I'm hanging out with Dawn Chapman tonight of Just Moms STL. I'm going to have her shamelessly plug everything again before we get back into it. But coming to the top of the hour break there, she was making a really good point about friendly fire and how the the people of Westlake and Coldwater Creek and all those surrounding areas. There's a there's actually a, a <laughs> there's a a, a top uh, um, there's a a topographical map, I guess it's, um, well, I guess it's like a topographical map I looked at of the area and just a few of the spots, and there's tons that we don't even know about. And it's that whole area. That whole area. Not just Westlake or Coldwater Creek, but pretty much all around St. Louis. There's stuff that I guarantee you people don't even know about all over that area. So all of you, everyone is affected by this. That place is really, really not as safe as the EPA is telling people. And all of those people are all victims of World War II and the Cold War and the nuke industry. They're all victims of the Manhattan Project. Everything. Somebody 
Somebody had to have known that nuke waste was there. And they just threw it into the dirt and didn't care. They just buried things like it didn't exist and didn't tell anybody. And that kind of stuff doesn't happen by accident. But I don't want to get too conspiratorial. Anyway, Dawn was making a really good point that the people that live there are victims of friendly fire. Although I would say it's the worst type of friendly fire you could possibly imagine. The nuke kind. The kind that you don't even see. You can't dodge that bullet. It's easy to dodge a tracer around. Well, okay, it's not so easy to dodge bullets, but you get my point. If you know you're being fired at, you know to duck. If you have incoming fire, you know to cover yourself. Brace for impact. Try to find cover so you don't get hit by shrapnel. You don't know those bullets are coming at you. And they're not just hitting you once, they're hitting you on a daily basis. Because that's what you're, what's happening when you're being irradiated. That's, that's not fa- uh, fiction. That's not people making things up. That's not conspiracy theory. That's not people trying to scare anybody. That's, that's just fact. That's what's going on. And it's a really, really deep, poignant point that she makes about it. So I'm going to, even though I've pontificated on it a little bit, and I've blabbered a little bit because I wanted to say my two cents on it. I want to give the floor back to Dawn and let her bring that point up again. But before you do, Dawn, I want you to go ahead and shamelessly plug Twitter, Facebook, the website, and everything again, and including your contact email so other hosts in the alternative media on radio and podcasts and bloggers and whoever can get in touch with you. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Please email us at westlakemoms at gmail. Dot com. Our Twitter handles are Don Chapman STL, Just Moms STL, Westlake Moms STL. Our Facebook page is West Lake Landfill. Three words: West Lake Landfill and Just Moms STL. And we could really use your help. We could use you guys coming onto Facebook and liking us on Twitter and liking us on Facebook and um, suggesting your friends. And, and again, follow them, Twitter bomb, put their, their Twitter handles in there, hashtag go to Westlake. And don't just do it now. Continue to do this, ladies and gentlemen. And call these offices, call these congressmen and senators, email them, and tell them, look, you need to go down and you need to take this seriously. You're not taking this seriously. You know, they, they take less important mundane garbage seriously. I bet you they would take a vote on their raise. Seriously, on their on their yearly pay raise, I bet you bet you they take that pretty serious. This is a little bit more important, I would say. So hashtag on Twitter, hashtag go to Westlake. So Don, back to that point you were making. Go ahead and rewind and uh, pick up wherever you want with that, because I, I thought it was very deep how you said that the people of Westlake and Coldwater Creek, and like I said, the entire St. Louis area, because there's a lot of other dirty spots around there that some we know, some we don't even know, right? At this point, you can't really right. take what they have to say to be truthful. you got to figure if there's sites that you know about and they haven't told you things about, there's probably 10 times the amount of things that we don't know hiding around there. So um, you made a really good point about how all of you, including you and Karen, everybody there that's affected by this and everybody that, um, you know, from, like I said, Coldwater Creek, everybody around there, you are all victims of not only the Manhattan Project, but... You so eloquently put, friendly fire. So go ahead, the floor is yours. You know, this is, again, this waste was created by our federal government in defense of this country, right or wrong, wherever the listener stands on that issue. The fact is, that is why it was created. It was a war effort, part of World War II. It was top secret. And so for it to sit out in communities, and it is still sitting out in communities here in St. Louis, sitting out in communities all over the nation, but here in St. Louis, because it was so top secret, um, it was spilled. We have, we have documents that talk about spills where, because they didn't want to draw attention, they would just hose it off on the side of the street into a ditch. 
guess what, guys? Every time it rains, that waste makes its way with the water into creeks, into people's backyards, into schools. This this situation, I want to talk a little bit about the activism side of this situation. Um, it used to be, it's not so bad now, I have to be honest, but it used to be that people would call us activists, and for me that was like a smack in the face. It was like being called a derogatory name because I never viewed myself as it because I always thought, right or wrong in my head, that an activist found something they were passionate about and chose it. And for myself, and I know for Karen, and I know for the other moms and people involved in this, you know, we didn't choose this. We woke up one day and found out that this was happening and had been allowed to happen in our area for some time. And now when I look back on it, I don't even... It doesn't even bother me in the slightest. But this is a grassroots effort. The people that are fighting this with us here on the ground that are on the page, our good friend Kristen, these people, many of these people are suffering from cancer. Guys, they are, they are on Facebook. They are calling elected officials. They are helping us host public meetings in between chemotherapy treatments and treatments for their thyroid. I mean, these people are so sick. Anyone that's been exposed to this radioactive waste like these people here in St. Louis have and all over the country, you know, it's almost like a ticking time bomb inside of their body. They've been exposed. There's nothing they can do about that. And, um, you know, eating healthy, trying to live healthy, but more importantly, trying to spend every waking minute they can with their family and loved one making memories because you don't know when you're going to wake up and the big C word is going to hit you. And yet these people have stepped up and they are fighting to make sure that other people don't become exposed to this waste. They are sacrificing precious time with their family and loved ones in order to make it safer for others, knowing darn good and well that there's nothing they can do to take back what's happened to them. And to me, that is, that is such a, if I can call it a silver lining or something beautiful that's happening in the midst of this disaster, that's one of the things that we're seeing. We're seeing community people, neighbors, who may have just nodded at each other across the street, really stepping out and caring deeply for each other and wanting to, wanting to make this and leave this better for their children and their grandkids. And I, that kind of effort, I think, ought to be applauded. And I don't think it ought to be. Um, instead, you know, we've got these huge corporations like Republic Services We've got them, you know, calling these people activists, calling these people troublemakers, calling, you know, saying they're stirring, they're stirring up the pot. They're, they're hurting their city economically by shedding light and by talking to the press and by, by holding informational, you know, protests. That is such a blame the victim mentality that's occurring. And that's a lot of the opposition that we're facing. It's a lot of the intimidation. You know, we're having, you know, and instead of instead of some of these city officials and the county councils and you know, and the city councils, instead of them saying, "Wow, for once we have this community that stepped up. They love their community. They want it to be cleaned up. They want to save it." Instead, they're actually fighting back and striking at the residents saying, "Well, Every time you speak up, you're causing everybody else's property to drop. And it is, that is one of the things that I think, you know, we appreciate as moms and especially talking to you, Popeye, that there are other groups out there that can maybe reach out to our Facebook page, other communities that are going through something similar, and lend an ear to listen to these people and kind of Tell these people your perspective because I have a feeling that we're not alone in this, that there are other communities that maybe not with the Manhattan Project but with other waste 
have um, have been on the receiving end of this kind of resistance and this kind of intimidation, either by big corporation, by the government, or who knows. And so for the listeners, you know, if you know, you're wondering why we want you on our Facebook page, that's one of the reasons. You know, if you've experienced a similar situation, reach out to some of these poor people that are really feeling stepped on and um, really feeling intimidated and lend them your support. You know, explain what happened in your situation to them. Let these people know that they're not alone here in St. Louis dealing with this issue. That these issues, similar issues, creep up all over our nation and that the one thing they have in common is that they almost never fix themselves. You know, it takes a large group of people, takes a bunch of people who are willing to stand up and have a voice to make that change happen. A thousand percent agreed. And that's actually why I have the term be the change tattooed on the side of my neck because I actually wholeheartedly believe in that. And that's actually what you just said. You have to get out and do it. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better myself. And I agree that all of you need to come together, not just the locals. I mean, the locals need to get along and come together and realize that you're all on the same team. And I'm sure there's probably groups uh, like we were talking about that um, maybe feel that you guys aren't moving fast enough or people that probably feel that you guys aren't moving fast enough or whatnot. Everybody needs to put whatever differences aside and work together. Uh, you're you're not going to be able to take on the juggernaut and be efficient at it if everybody is running around doing their own thing and disorganized. Everybody can have their own take on things or their own way of doing things as long as it's ef- effective and not drawing unwanted negative attention or anything like that. But everybody needs to like work together and communicate. You know, maybe one group does something, you know, does like a street action where they, maybe you guys go out and burn DVDs. Somebody put together, you know, somebody sit down with their video editor, make a, make a documentary about Westlake, put, put information together, burn it, go out and buy some blank DVDs. Uh, you can, you can find places where you can get them in bulk cheap and they're good quality. You, you burn, this is what I used to do, burn a couple hundred, maybe a thousand copies of it and you get that team to go out on the street and hand out DVDs. You and Karen are doing your thing with the pages and all the presentations you're doing. I mean, there's a ton of different ways to do things. People need to open up YouTube channels. The people that are sick, you want to make a big, you want to make a big impression. This is what one of the things the BP oil spill people did. A lot of the victims, like the cleanup people that went there and then they got sick, a lot of these people, they went and they started YouTubing every day. They just made a YouTube channel and they started video capturing themselves every day with their webcam of like their and they would give like a daily update of their health and you could see over the course of time how some of these people were getting sicker and sicker and sicker and it was forcing people to pay attention to this that kind of stuff too i mean there's tons of ideas and don't be afraid to reach out to activists don't be afraid to reach out to people like me radio show hosts i'm an old school activist reach out to people like rad chick she's over on twitter just look her up at rad chick the number 4 cast at R-A-D-C-H-I-C-K, the number four cast. If you're a local and you're thinking about activism, you, know, you can ask her. It, you, I want you people to reach out outside of your, your area of comfortability. Reach out to these radio show hosts. Reach out to bloggers. Ask for help. Don't be afraid. And you, know, you answered a question before I even had to ask it about the the property value thing i was going to ask you are there people that are hesitant to speak up because they don't want their property value to drop and you answered that which absolutely is- we see that a lot we really do and and it's not that we're not cognizant of that you know that is a side thing and when for some of these people i mean your your home is everything to you and um the thing is is unfortunately with the story of what we've seen, you know, sometimes we don't always we don't always die in our homes. When we go to sell our homes, we need to make sure that we're selling property and homes that are safe for the next buyer. And that wasn't the case 
in um, North County and in these areas around the creek, it's still not the case. You know, there's no disclosure of this waste anywhere. It's, it's, it's still amazing to me that I can buy a home, and if the owner knows that there's lead paint in it, they legally have to disclose that and tell me. And yet I can buy a, a home tomorrow anywhere within less than two miles of a Superfund site with the world's oldest radioactive waste, and nobody, the federal government, nobody has to let me know. I mean, to me, there are so many things like that that for people to want to get involved in that we can, you know, we can lobby and we can change laws that make it so that those types of things do have to be disclosed because I think it would help in the long run when you're fighting these issues it would help with getting the word out about these issues and what's happening. And, you know, we, um, because we're not, I guess we are accidental activists, I guess you could call us that, you know, we are so open to people coming in with suggestions. I, you know, there is, our, our, our worlds look so much different now, Karen and mine, than they did two and a half, three years ago. And, um, you know, there are those people like you and others who who have some experience that, that we desperately, we, we would love to hear from you. We would love to hear your suggestions. Um, you know, the main thing that we fight here in St. Louis is media. We're fighting with the local media, and um, although many of them have been helpful, this is such a deep story that... Um, it's hard for people when they go to contact national media to try and make them aware of this issue. So if there's anyone listening that has national media contacts, we could always use your help with that in getting this story out. Because it's not until, you know, when CBS came in, it's not until national media grabbed this that for some of these people it became very real. You know, until then it was almost... It wasn't a myth, but it was it was hard to believe two my two moms in a community group who were trying to spread the word. But the moment it went out, so many people came flooding in. We went from about a little less than four thousand people on our Westlake Landfill Facebook page to eighteen thousand. And those people were absolutely starving and they still are. They are starving for information and they are They want to be told what to do and who to go and who to call. And so um, that's one of the things that I'd like to plug real quick. We have a community meeting this Thursday, November 19th at 6.30 p.m. at John Calvin Presbyterian Church. And it is going to be live streamed. We will live stream this meeting. We'll have information on the Facebook pages and on the website of how you can log on and watch but um, we're asking you to log on. We're asking if you live in the area to attend and bring a friend. It's very important that you guys come to this meeting, not just for your show of support, but to get some of the handouts and the facts. We can give you guys everything that we've learned we want to share with everyone else so that you guys know what's going on and you can not only make your own decisions, but you can also be part of um, spreading the word and letting people understand what's happening. And, um, you know, it's we can email that material to you, but it's so much easier if you guys come out and, you know, you come and get some of these flyers. We also have so many sign-ups right now. People are asking what they can do. We need volunteers. We need people to go to the elected official's office. You know, um, in defense of Congressman Clay, he is the only one calling for removal of this waste. There is what the elected officials and the the school district and everybody that sits around here, for some reason with Westlake Landfill, they're very worried about using that word removal. But the interesting thing is if you go not only half a mile, maybe two miles away from this site, you can actually sit out there and watch them dig up and remove the same waste from parks, from people's backyards, from the side of roads, from the airport site. We have been removing this radioactive waste now 
for over a decade in St. Louis. It's actually being cleaned up and put in trains and shipped to a licensed facility. And the reason it's so important that listeners understand that is because part of the opposition to what Karen and I are doing here in this community group is actually being paid for by the owner of the site, Republic Services. They actually have created a group called the Coalition to Keep Us Safe. And they are opposing the cleanup of Westlake Landfill. They want to leave the waste there and put dirt on top of it, leave it in the groundwater, leave it in a floodplain, leave it next to a site that's had many fires and is currently experiencing a huge underground fire. And their whole thought of doing that, obviously, is trying to get the cheapest solution that they're going to end up having to pay for. But what they don't realize, and maybe they do realize it and they're just that evil, but there are people in North County, there are people who have this waste in their backyard right now, and that needs to get cleaned up. And yet here's this huge corporation saying, no, 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 wait, 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 we don't want trucks, we don't want this being put on, we don't want this being put on trains. But and in doing that, they're actually putting people's lives at risk. And we can argue that there is maybe no safe place on this planet for this material. We can actually have that argument, um, but in people's backyards, there has to be another place to put it besides there. You know, and and that is another reason why we need as many people as we can, because this is a fully funded lobby group that this corporation, you know, is paying for. We we cannot, we can't combat them with money, but we can combat them with voices. Asymmetric warfare, Dawn. <laughs> it, it, that's how you fight this battle. You can't fight them with money, like you said, and that would be like standing head to head with a huge army. Right. Instead, instead, you have to participate in asymmetric warfare. You have to fight guerrilla okay. style. You you have to you have to think like that. And, and using social media and things like YouTube and activism and old, just old school flyering and DVD handouts and stuff like that, a draw attention. And everybody needs to get over the whole house value thing. And you don't have to say it. I'll say it, Don. Everybody needs to get over that. Look, I'm going to tell you from an outsider's perspective. House values mean nothing. None of that means anything, ladies and gentlemen. The only thing that matters is you and your kids. That's it. All that matters is you and your kids and your health. And that is it. Everything else is secondary BS. And you know what? I know there's a lot of emotion and investment involved in a house. Trust me, I have a house. So I understand what home ownership is like. But that stuff is secondary compared to you and your children and your health. It really is. It's that simple. And I wouldn't recommend staying there. And we're only, we're about to get cut off by the break just as we get to this point too, figures. Uh, we can pick up on the other side with that and solutions too. But I, uh, I so yeah, just we'll, we'll, we'll hold that thought. So ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere. Three short minutes when we get back, Dawn and I will pick up right there. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, final segment. Dawn said something earlier. And uh, I had made this comment to her during the, uh, the top of the hour break there, between hour one and hour two. We were chatting during the break, and I had said to her that her, Karen, and everyone else is not alone. And she mentioned that on air, she wants people to know that they're not alone and there's other activists out there. And I want to reiterate that point again, that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not. None of you are alone. There's more people out there that are free-thinking, open-minded individuals that want to help you than you could possibly imagine. There's an entire alternative media, ladies and gentlemen, I bet you many of you don't even know exists. Allow this to be your doorway if I may reference The Matrix for a moment, you should go watch the first Matrix movie. I've done a couple shows on it. There's, it's an allegory much deeper than you could possibly imagine, but 
Morpheus says to Neo, I can only show you the door. You have to be the one to walk through it in order to see the truth, see what was really going on. That's what's happening here. This, this problem with Westlake and the radiation and the ensuing cancers and health problems years down the road, all of that, all of that is your doorway, ladies and gentlemen. Allow yourself to step through it and see the truth. And wherever that journey leads you, you know, so be it. Don't allow past beliefs to block you from accepting new information. Make sure you have a filter. Understand you want to look for empirical evidence and things like that. But allow this to be your doorway. Anyway, I want to get back to Dawn because we only have a about 24 minutes with her left tonight and I want to give her as much time as I can. I want to get into solutions and a few things with her. Dawn, really quick, throw out Twitter, Facebook, email, website, everything again. Go ahead. Shamelessly plug yourself. Please go to westlakemoms at gmail.com for the Facebook pages. We have two West Lake Landfill, that's three words, West Lake Landfill, and Just Moms STL. I want to throw out a, a third Facebook page for you, Humans of West Lake. If you get on that Facebook page, there's pictures and stories so you can see who the people that live in this community are and how they've been affected. Twitter would be um, West Lake Moms, Twitter handle, um, Don Chapman STL, Just Moms STL. Our website is stlradwayslegacy.com. And um, as Pop, I mentioned, you know, we really look forward to hearing from you all. And um, just a shout out that, you know, you listened and that, you know, you guys are thinking about us. This is, this is new to the people that live in this area. You know, they, they do feel very isolated and very alone. And um, they're learning. They're having to learn um, boots on the ground, unfortunately, how to survive in this situation and what to do. And, um, you know, those who have been through it before, your stories are very important. You know, we always joke here, the moms laugh and we say, boy, don't we wish there was a textbook we can just open up and flip to a chapter and say, what do you do when this happens? What do you do when this large corporation creates this, this lobby group and is throwing money at this opposition? And the answer is you guys. The listeners, there's probably many of you that have had that happen and can reach out and tell us your stories and what you guys did, what worked, what didn't work. I think that, you know, again, for those of us that live here, you know, when I, we, we say the moms because that's what we call ourselves, you know, this situation is so incredibly surreal to us and... um you know, we try we try not to take anything, you know, the wrong way. We try any any suggestion people give, we try and use it as best as we can. We've been very lucky. Um, Lois Gibbs from Love Canal, the mother of Superfund, has reached out and has been an incredible resource to us. Um, you know, we've had a lot of other people from across the nation who have dealt with other... Um, you know, radioactive waste type sites that have fought the government that have reached out to us and have taught us a trick or two for Facebook or, frankly, how to tweet. It was really funny. Karen and I had no idea how to tweet before this. That was a learning experience all on its own. And, um, you know, we're very... The one thing that I would like to say to those listening and those that have been involved in other causes, maybe not even just radiation related, you know, I really just want to thank you for being involved in your causes because I never under this is such a different world for us than it was three years ago. We never understood that a community could be faced with this. We never thought we'd ever have to fight our EPA. We never thought we'd ever have to fight elected officials and corporations and to understand that this goes on more than we probably understand in other communities, 
you know, our heart goes out to you guys, too, for what it's worth. And, um, you know, the future of St. Louis, what we can do, um, we need to get this radioactive waste cleaned up. We need to get this out of communities. It needs to be out of people's backyards. We need signs up in the creek. Creek, some of these areas are going to take a while to clean up. It's, it's pretty complicated. And in the meantime, we need to do what we can to keep current people from becoming exposed. I need to know that this is here and that, you know, so that they can make their own choices. Like I said, it's it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be a beautiful weekend here. You know, on a gorgeous weekend, you can come out and see kids playing in a contaminated creek with Manhattan waste. That still happens. And it's being allowed to happen. And we need to put a stop to that. We need to make sure that, in the meantime, while it's taking some time to clean this up, we stop people from being exposed as best we can. Westlake Landfill is a mess. It is a hot mess, no pun intended. You have a fire approaching radioactive waste. There are so many different, I mean, the scientists behind the scenes are arguing over what happens when a fire hits radioactive waste. They are looking at what's occurring under the ground at this landfill with this fire and with the radioactive waste, and they are trying to predict exactly what will happen when the two meet or if they meet. There's arguing. The common sense people who are listening will tell you that it is never a good idea to let fire hit radioactive waste. That is just an asinine thing to ever let happen. And so we have to come up with some sort of permanent solution to stop that, whether that means removing the radioactive waste that's on the surface and some of it that's in the ground, whether that's putting a fire out, you know, that is, I think, one of the most difficult things that makes Westlake such a political issue is that the elected officials, and again, you know, we do have one at least calling for removal of the waste, but they're afraid to talk about this issue because they don't have the solution. And we've actually heard them say that, say this is a very tough issue for us to talk about because we can't flat out say what the solution should be. And, you know, my response to somebody that lives next to this site is, you're never going to find that solution. You're never going to be able to prevent these two from meeting if you don't speak out. So it's a catch-22. Let's call this site what it is, which is an incredibly dangerous site that has the potential for something massive, a nuclear incident to happen, and it doesn't matter how small that potential is, the potential exists, and that's enough, and then we need to find a way to come together and, and keep it from happening. And for us, those you mentioned people living in their homes, we are pushing as hard as we can for those living on top of this site, which is a little less than half a mile away, to be voluntarily bought out. Those people need to get out of there. This is not a site that anybody needs to be living next to. For people like Karen and myself that live a little bit further away, although obviously a mile and a half to two miles isn't super far from this site by any means, you know, um, we find ourselves daily trying to make the best decision we can for our family. And, you know, I know last time I was on your show, I talked a little bit about that, and you asked me, you know, about, you know, what was my personal decision? Was I going to leave and was I going to go? And, um, you know, we are still having that conversation here. I, because you're right, we are seeing that people that are exposed to this waste, they're not okay. You know, we, we, I'm not finding anybody who played in the creek as a child and ended up not having a consequence in their family. Maybe not with them, but maybe with, with, a, with their own children or maybe with their grandchildren because this is multi-generational. I mean, the consequences to the exposure to this material are absolutely devastating. They really are. And... I, I, you know, there, there is just too much at risk there to leave it the way it is. Um, 
one of the things that I would encourage people who are listening and people that are thinking about attending the meeting, you know, that is one of the most heartbreaking things is you we do allow a question and answer and a comment period at the end of our meetings. And that is a lot of what you'll hear is people standing up going, what should we do? You know, this is, for people, their home is their American dream. It's where they choose to raise their family. Um, you know, they're really having a hard time deciding. And that's unfortunately a very personal decision that these people have to make. It's not one that Karen or I or anybody can frankly make for them. And, you know, like I said, on a personal level, it's one that I struggle with every day. Well, you you answered the the question again without me even bringing it back up. And uh, right on point, as always, Don. And I agree with you. Uh, You know, like I said, even you guys should move. I think everybody within a five-mile radius of that place should move. And, I, yeah, there should be buyouts. The question is who would pay for it. Of course, they would probably try to throw it on the government. I'm sure the corporations wouldn't want to shoulder that burden. And there'd be legal battles about who would be responsible for it. And that could go on for a while. What I would suggest is, again, everybody if everybody came together and realized their true power as a community, if you all could come together do the research, find a, an attorney, find a, a, a law group, whoever, that's willing to represent you, somebody that specializes in, I don't know, environmental. Maybe people should reach out to Erin Brockovich. I keep bringing her up. People should reach out to her. Isn't, doesn't she have her own law firm now? Doesn't she specialize in things like this? Reach out to Erin. Not, not just you guys. I mean, and, and when I say you, by the way, Dawn, I don't, quite often reference just you and Karen. You and Karen are doing amazing things. You two are amazing ladies, just so you know. I'm, I'm also speaking to the listeners because I want the listeners to understand that the government's not going to come save you. You're the solution to your problem. Look what the government's already done for you. Nothing. And they're lying to you. And they're blocking you. And they're dragging their feet. That's not typical government. That's them covering their butts. That's what they're doing, ladies and gentlemen. They don't care about you. So you have to be the solution to the problem. You all have to come together and work together as an effective, efficient team. If you need help, there's other old school activists you can reach out to all across the board. Many different things, whether they're anti-nuke, whether they're whatever. Doesn't matter. You can always reach out to people. Don't be afraid to talk to other people. And when I, I know it's, look, again... As a homeowner myself, I know it's very easy for me because I'm not there to say, well, you should just pack your crap and leave. I understand it's not easy. But to me, as from an outsider, I just want to stress the point again. Your family, your children, and you. You're all more important. Your health is way more important, ladies and gentlemen, than the value of your house or, you know, any physical material. You can, eventually that stuff can be replaced it might be emotionally tough from point A to point B in that journey. It might even take a long period of time. I have no doubt that you people can get through it. And although it might seem tougher, it's way tougher to stay and be irradiated because you're just killing yourself and you're going to destroy your future and your children's future. Don't, right. don't do that. I mean, for me to you people, please don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't agree with you more, Dawn. And it's very personal. You're right. It's a very personal decision, and I don't want people to think that I say that to you very flippantly going, oh, you should just move. Because I I wholeheartedly understand the predicament you're in, and I don't want you to think that when I say to you, you should leave, you know, I don't want to come across like I'm just, you know, well, it's easy for you to say. I, I wholeheartedly understand what you people are going through, but I'm concerned about your health and your safety and your children's health and safety at this point. Right. And, you know, and, and I know we don't take it that way. You know, we, um, you know, I, I think the last time I was on your show, you know, I ended it with a personal story and got a little emotional. And I'll just throw another personal story out. You know, um, yesterday we were in a meeting, and I mean we were in a meeting very late. We have meetings twice a month. We have these wonderful Franciscan sisters that let us use their boardroom and support us and, 
They are just phenomenal. They cook us dinner. They, you know, they provide some one night of the week where I know that I don't have to cook. And that means a lot, you know, from one mom. But last night was my son's first volleyball game. He's 10 years old, and he's never joined any sports. This is the first time he's just out of the blue. I want to do volleyball. And, you know, so we were excited. And as a family, I had this meeting. So I'm like, well, I'll go to the volleyball game first. Please let it. I'm going to stay for the whole thing. I might be a little late to the meeting. And as I'm sitting there on the bleachers, you know, again, for the listeners that have been through something, please reach out to us. I can't explain to you guys how isolated this feels. You know, I'm sitting on the bleachers with my family and my two little kids and my husband watching my son, and he is just as cute as he can be trying to swing at this volleyball. And, you know, I'm surrounded by these other parents. And, you know, this is such a consuming issue that everywhere I go, I'm I'm in a different school in in their gymnasium, and I'm thinking, how far am I from nuclear weapons waste? Like, in my head, I'm calculating it. (coughs) And so as I'm sitting there, you know, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, there are all these parents that have no idea, and they are so happy and just, you know, cheering on their kids. And in the back of my mind, I, I... this streak of jealousy hit. You know, I am not jealous for much in this world, but the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your family's safe. There is a peace of mind that comes with that that I feel like I've been robbed of. And it was very clear last night sitting there that that my joy is somehow a little bit less than the other parents because I know in the back of my mind that my children are at risk, you know, and it was very cognizant. And so that is something that we deal with. That is something that I personally deal with, you know, sitting there surrounded by people who have no idea, kind of going back to the matrix thing. Is it, is it, is ignorance bliss? Is is, is it bliss? And the answer is it's not when your kids' lives are being put at risk. Just because you're ignorant of that fact doesn't mean that it's not happening to your kids and those kids. And I have to constantly remember that, that if I could go back three years ago, um, as much as this has changed my life and as much as I have no idea what it's going to be tomorrow or or a week or a month from now, I'm grateful for the opportunity to know what I live next to. I'm glad that I, I learned of this situation because, I have the right, I think we all have the right of citizens with knowing and understanding what it is we're living next to and what's really going on. Agreed. You have to know, you have to be aware of the problem in order, it's, it's, uh, what's the first step in uh, solving a problem is admitting that there is one and knowing that there is one. That's the, the official first step, right? Don, I want you to plug everything really quick because we only got about five minutes left. I want you to go ahead and I want you to pl- I want you to plug everything again. I want you to plug because um, there was a. I, I know for a second we probably lost sound for about two or three seconds there. So before we run out of time here, I want you to plug um, email first and foremost that people can get in touch with you, and I, I, you can repeat it as many times as you need. And then um, Twitter, Facebook, and the website. Go ahead. Sure. Um, Please contact us at westlakemoms at gmail.com. Again, westlakemoms at gmail.com. Our Twitter is JustMomsSTL, WestlakeMoms. You can follow me on Twitter, just um, Dawn Chapman STL. Our Facebook pages are West Lake Landfill. That's three words, West Lake Landfill, JustMomsSTL. Also, if you're new, get on Humans of Westlake. That is a great place for you to go and actually view some of our personal testimonies and our stories and get to know who we are. Um, We just encourage you guys to reach out to us. These people, they need to hear your stories. They need to know that you support them and that they're not alone. Agreed. And you guys aren't alone, just so everybody's, you know, everybody's clear on this. You guys are not alone. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not alone. I'll repeat that again. You are not alone. 
there's a lot of us. There is a lot of us out there that are thinking about you every day, that care about you. And I urge you all, again, in the alternative media, to reach out to Dawn, email her, um, follow them on Twitter, spread the word, help, offer some advice. Even if you don't, you know, you don't do a radio show, maybe you're an old school activist, you can offer them some advice in an email. And because we didn't have time, like I said, I wanted to give Dawn as much time, two full hours, not even enough time. I could probably give her another hour. But I'm going to do another show on this. And what I'd like to do is um, I haven't decided if I'll just do a live call-in show or if, um, depending on how many people contact me and how deep and long the stories are, I'd like to interview other people that live in the area that are willing to talk about what they've gone through and how they've been affected by this. So I'm going to throw my email out there really quick for you. It's popeyedtrh at gmail.com. Popeye, D-T-R-H, Delta Tango Romeo Hotel at gmail.com. One more time, Popeye, D-T-R-H at gmail.com. If you live around the area, please email me if you'd like to be interviewed and have your voice heard. You don't have to use your real name. We could use a, a different name if you need to. It's not a big deal. It's been done a bazillion times before, but I just want to put that offer out there since I didn't have time to take calls today because I want the other voices in the area to be heard. And again, you are all amazing out there. The, the, all of you that are standing up and talking about this and pushing and fighting. Dawn, you and Karen are absolutely amazing ladies. And I can't say thank you enough. Uh, from an outsider's perspective, somebody who's, I, I, this affects not only just you guys, it affects the whole country, especially if that stuff catches on fire. Right? And I just want to thank you for sacrificing everything that you do. I mean, you're sick as a dog. You come on the show tonight. I know you're tired. I know you get messed with. So I just want to thank you for me to you personally. Thank you so much for everything that you and Karen do. And thank you to all your, your, your fellow um, activists and the people that aren't named and that help you guys out too. You know, from the bottom of my heart and everybody else, uh, that is paying attention. We we respect you immensely, and we're we, you guys are not alone. And uh, you know, much love. Well, Karen just responded to tell you thank you from her. So she's listening, and um, you know that means a lot to us. It means a lot to us. It really does. We we have about um, a minute and a half. Uh, final thoughts. I think that what's been allowed to happen in this community is probably not unique. There are probably listeners that have had it happen to them, but it's unique to these people, and the secrecy of what's happening here is probably the worst thing because we have to break through that secrecy in order to get the word out to let people understand, and we have a big job against us. And, um, you know, one of the things that Karen says, which is so important, is that her parents didn't know. All the time that she was playing in that park growing up, her parents had no idea. And now she knows and she's raising her kids. You know, we, for those of us that know now, we have a responsibility. You know, there is part of Karen's parents and Karen that wishes, I'm sure, that somebody would have just, somebody who knew, because I'm convinced somebody knew that it probably wasn't a good idea for those people to be in that creek and be playing in those areas would have stepped forward and let them know and given them the option. And that's what we need help doing. We need to spread the word. We need help making sure people know because this problem won't fix itself. Superman is not coming. Agreed. You guys are all Superman and Superwomen or Wonder Woman or Wonder Women. (laughs) I guess Wonder Women would be the plural. Pro- proper English and grammar, Popeye. So, Dawn, I want to thank you again. We have about 30 seconds, but I, I just want to say thank you very much and much love and respect to you, Karen, and everybody else. And um, uh, I'll say goodbye to you off air as we, as we talked about before. So, thank you again, dear. Thank you. This is Ladies and gentlemen, wow. One of the most powerful and emotional interviews I've done in all the time doing radio. Wow. Ooh. Anyway, go help them out. As I always tell you, we are the solution to our problems. 
The solutions to our problems, ladies and gentlemen, are an inside job. I love you all. I believe in you all. I'm going to go be the superheroes. I know you all are. I'm out of here. <laughs>